Welcome back to Jack in the Booth, a web series about sports broadcasting. I'm Jack McShane. Now our guest this week is Spiro Ditas. Spiro can be heard calling NFL games on CBS as well as NBA games on TNT. Now coming up, you'll hear his thoughts on the NFL and NBA restart and how a little bit of luck jump-started his career. But we started with football, and I asked Spiro if he can see himself calling games from an NFL stadium this fall. I, I think I do. You know, I, I, there, there's deep down inside me, there's still an optimist, you know, despite this crazy world we're living in. And, and you know, the numbers seem to be getting worse, unfortunately, instead of getting better. But the optimist in me says that in some way, shape, or form, we will be calling NFL football. Now, will we be in a stadium broadcast booth as we have been typically? Or will we be in maybe a studio in CBS's headquarters in New York calling the games off monitors? That, I think, remains to be seen. And I don't think anyone knows that question. I don't think our, our bosses at CBS know. I don't think the people at the NFL know yet. I think what happens here over the next couple of months will determine, you know, maybe the, the dynamics and the logistics of everything. Um, I, I think there's still a possibility that we may even see fans at some point. Now, obviously not full stadiums at some point in, this, in the season, but I know that the goal from the people I've spoken to at the league and at CBS is that before the end of the NFL season, that there will be fans allowed in stadiums. Could be 10% capacity, 15 20%, whatever that number is. And that kind of leads to another question of, will the NFL consider maybe postponing the start of the season from September maybe to October to buy them some time till maybe a vaccine is found, maybe some new medications are found, or you know the COVID uh, infection rate goes down on its own to make things a little bit more safer. So obviously, from a business perspective, they want fans in the seats. Uh, there's so much money and income and revenue that's going to be lost in empty stadiums but as we've said, the virus is going to kind of dictate the terms of this. And, and that's, I think, what people are resigned to at this point. Now, you mentioned pushing the season back. I think today they cut the preseason in half. So that might be a little bit of a step towards mm -hmm. pushing the season back also. And you mentioned about the, the monitor. Now, how different is that calling a game off a monitor as opposed to calling a game with fans in a stadium? I'm sure. Is your preparation different or like how do you go about preparing for a game? On, yeah, calling it on a monitor. It's a great question. The preparation is the same. Nothing changes in terms of your Monday through Sunday prep, getting ready for the game. What does change is game day. Uh, I've, I've done basketball off monitors uh, during my time with NBA TV and Turner. Uh, it's, a, it's a big disconnect. You know, part of the, the great thing of, of being a play-by-play -play broadcaster, no matter what the sport, is being at the venue, uh, being courtside for a basketball game, being in a broadcast booth in an NFL stadium, among 60 or 70,000 people plus. That energy not only carries the players, it also carries us, the announcers. You feed off the energy. Um, it, it's a really, it's, it's, it's a sound and it's a really integral part of the whole broadcast experience. Suddenly you take that away and, and it's, it's a really different set of dynamics. And I, you know, I've talked to a lot of my, my colleagues in the industry and it's kind of a daunting thing because again, you know, your voice is kind of carried by that resonant ambient, uh, ambient noise that, that, you know, comes from the fans. So, you know, if you've ever, you know, if you've, if you've done this in any form, there's a big difference between calling a game in a stadium where the crowd is kind of dull and, and, you know, not too boisterous and then calling a game, you know, in Kansas city with, you know, 70,000 chief fans, there's nothing that can compare to that. And it's so starkly different. And so as announcers, if these venues are, are empty, we're going to have to kind of generate more noise and more energy. And that's, that's going to be challenging without a doubt. So are you a fan of um, some of the talks have been like, they're thinking about possibly pumping in crowd noise. Are you a fan of that? You know, at first when I heard it, Jack, I, I was against it. I thought it was something completely artificial. I didn't, you know, just didn't sound right to me. Uh, now, after having watched the Bundesliga, the German soccer league and Fox having done that, it actually sounds pretty natural. Um, and, and so I think maybe it, it is going to be something that we see, you know, now the NBA with its restart is just around the corner. And I've heard that the league is going to really get innovative, innovative in some of the things that they're going to try to do, not only pumping in that artificial noise through your TV as a viewer at home, but also pumping it in, in the venue itself for the players. Because if you're a player, obviously, you know, we've all played in, in empty gyms, you know, pickup games, imagine 
being an NBA player playing in a sold out arena. There's just, you know, there's such a, a difference in, in terms of the energy that the players themselves build off of. So I think we're all ready for anything. I think at this point, I think they're leaning towards some kind of an artificial crowd noise um, put into these broadcasts. But, you know, we're, we're all just waiting to see. We're all waiting to see what happens. Now, getting back to the play-by-play aspect of calling a game, when you're calling a game, you're looking at the monitor and the field. Now, how do you know when to look at the monitor and when to look at the field? And do you look at one more than the other? Another great question. Uh, you know, under normal circumstances, and, and all this is done, I, I think the more reps you get, everyone has their own way to do it. There's no correct blueprint. Um, as the years have gone on and I've got, gained more experience doing this, I have tried to, you know, especially in football where you're kind of elevated up, you know, where maybe the middle road of, of, of where the seats are. So we're considerably up above the playing field. I like in football to really be calling most of the game off the monitor. And the reason for that is simple. I, I want to be seeing what the viewer at home is seeing. So if my director is cutting to some shots of, of the coach on the sideline, if he's cutting to a player on the sideline, whatever the case may be, I want to make sure I'm commentating off what the viewer is seeing. Because if there's a disconnect between me, the play-by-play guy, and what the director is cutting for the viewer, it's not going to be as enhanced the broadcast. Now, there's obviously a lot of communication that goes on during the course of a game. I could tell the director, hey, in my off, uh, my talkback button, which is off air, say while the analyst is talking, I could hit my button and say, hey, you know, Jim, my director in the NFL, Jim, I want to talk about the coach here coming up. You know, get me a camera shot here as soon as you can. He'll hit me back and say, I've got the shot. And then we're kind of in lockstep. And that's what kind of makes the viewing experience at home more seamless. You know, we've got a story on Tom Brady. Hey, Jim, you know, give me a shot of Brady coming out here out after this play. If nothing drastic happens, a long touchdown that we have to cover. Um, basketball is a little different. Basketball, we're on the floor. You know, the action is literally right in front of you. So most of the action uh, I'm calling, looking at the, you know, the guys right in front of me, maybe a replay off the monitor, certainly. Um, But those are some of the big differences between the two sports that I do, football and basketball. Now, transitioning a little bit to the NBA, um, I know you mentioned like you do basketball uh, for TNT. Do you plan on calling games in the uh, in the fall? Have they told you anything yet? Um, yeah, very preliminary, but we're, we're waiting here in the next couple of days. I'm hoping to be in Orlando, uh, you know, to be a part of this, you know, unprecedented experience with the, with the bubble and everything that that's going to entail, the, the logistics that the NBA and, and all the networks have, have really uh, tried to figure out here on the fly. I mean, this is a Herculean effort from, from every vantage point. Uh, Adam Silver, I think, has been incredible. Uh, his visionary leadership that we've seen really from, from the first day he took office uh, replacing David Stern has been just incredible. And these are unprecedented times without a doubt, you know, COVID has changed everything. The world is, is upside down, you know, down is up and up is down as we've seen. So, uh, I'm hoping to be there. Um, could be a month, could be a couple of weeks, but you know, as, as you know, a lot of the guys that do the NBA on TNT and the NBA on ESPN also double up and they do other sports. Mm -hmm. So for those of us now that we know we'll be in Orlando, you have to stay in the bubble. You can't come in and out. You know, usually Mm -hmm. under normal circumstances, say for instance, Ian Eagle, you know, goes back between his Brooklyn Nets job, pops in, flies into a city to do NBA and TNT game. He can leave the next day to go back to the Nets. Now he's got to decide, you know, kind of between sports. So a lot of these guys who do multiple sports, Brian Anderson and uh, uh, the list goes on and on, Kevin Harlan, so it's going to be very challenging, not only for the networks, but also for a lot of the announcers, guys that I've looked up to for, for you know, all my time in this business to try to decide how you can kind of piecemeal through this. So this is challenging, not only for the networks and for the teams and the players and the coaches, but, but also for some of the guys in broadcasting. And you mentioned the challenges that a lot of people are going to face during these times. You know, Adam Silver's had the difficult job of figuring out, well, if players are really going to come and play in Orlando because they have a lot of issues that they have to consider, you know, injury because they've been off for so long, families and and other things like that. Do you do you think that we're going to have an NBA season like it's going to finish all the way through or is there a chance where we could play and then they'll stop again? Like that would probably be worst case scenario, right? Uh, You know, Jack, I I don't think anyone knows the answer to that. I I think right now the plan is that they're going to play. And I think considering the resources and the time uh, and just the general effort that's been put into this 
and really what's at stake financially above all we could talk about everything else but the amount of money that would be lost if the season were to be canceled would just be catastrophic i think for the nba and you also consider the fact what happened with china in october with the amount of revenue that was lost with the uh, with the daryl morey uh, tweet and that whole situation so I, I think the the incentive is certainly there uh, but at the same time, the league has to be careful. Player health and safety and the well-being of, of NBA staffers and everyone that has to be there is is really you know tantamount and, and the most important part of this. And I think that's why you're seeing the league and individual teams be very lenient with players and really put the decision on their shoulders. And if players choose to opt out, as we've seen a number of really key guys amongst a, a big group of guys back out, I think you're seeing teams be very okay with that, especially now with the social justice component that's been uh, thrown into the mix after the, uh, the tragic uh, passing of George Floyd has really added another wrinkle to this. So, you know, uh, who knows what, what could happen? We're seeing now the COVID cases spiking in big parts of the country in Florida, very close to where the bubble would be just outside of Orlando. So it's just, it's just we're living in crazy times. And, I, you know, from day to day, we don't know what's going to happen. Now, transitioning to your earlier career, I know you were at uh, WFEV, and you worked your way up the ranks pretty quickly after you got out of college. I think you were on three out of the four major networks by the age of 31, which is pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. Now, how did you manage to do that? And was it luck or was it just having really good connections in the business? Well, first of all, I, I, I officially feel old, as I told, told you before we started, you know, coming in at Fordham when your pop was there a couple of years ahead of me, one of the guys that I certainly looked up to. But you know, more than anything else, I think this business is, is so much about luck and timing. And mm -hmm. for me, I knew going in how competitive this industry is. I knew how difficult it would be to find a job, any job. You know, would I have to move from my hometown of New Jersey and just outside New York to go to some small market, you know, in West Virginia or South Dakota? I was prepared to do anything. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I remember getting in a car with one of my uh, FUV colleagues, Mike Maffe, and driving about 14, 15 hours to uh, Tama, Iowa for a summer internship. And, and you know, we, we just knew that this could be a part of the country where we would have to work and kind of make our bones after graduation. I was very fortunate in that one of my professors in Fordham, a uh, man by the name of John Cirillo, who had his own uh, PR company, public relations man in New York City, former communications director at the Garden, really kind of took me under his wing, uh, heard one of my tapes early on my freshman year, uh, told me that he thought that I had some potential. And, and John basically started becoming and acting as my agent while I was still a student at Fordham. Got me a job with the XFL in the XFL's first go around in 2001 while I was still a student. Uh, it was just an unbelievable opportunity to be the sideline reporter for the New York, New Jersey hitmen. Uh, and so I could remember driving to the airport on, on a weekend, flying to Las Vegas for the opening weekend of the XFL season, getting on a plane, going back to New York for school on Monday morning. And, you know, I was just living the dream. And, you know, that job led to another. I had a couple of chances to do some overnight update shifts at, at WFA and radio in New York, you know, the station that, that all of us in the Northeast grew up listening to. Uh, that led to another job. And then, you know, 2005, I get the big opportunity to, to move out to LA and become the radio voice of the Lakers. And, and I've told the story a bunch of times. For me, it was just, uh, you know, it was right place, right time. The Lakers were looking for a young announcer to build with. I was a young guy with a very weak resume compared to so many other people who were hoping to get that job. And, um, you know, it, it's, I would say it's 90% luck and then 10% what you do with that opportunity once you're able to get your foot kind of wedged into the door. Do you prioritize like saying yes to everything early on, which then leads to bigger opportunities in the future, right? For sure. You know, that, that was some of the advice that I got, you know, try to make yourself as well rounded as possible. Learn the behind the scenes stuff, learn the technical stuff. Um, I was not great at any of those things. I, I tried to, to be perfectly honest with you. I tried to avoid doing those things to really put all my eggs into the play by play basket and really using my time to hone my skills in those uh, areas. I wouldn't give that advice to, to most kids. And I don't tell them that, you know, some of the broadcast students that I've talked to during the course of the year, I think as, as versatile as you can be, uh, you know, work on your talk show chops, you know, do games, um, 
you know, even being an analyst, you know, try to just try to make yourself as well-rounded as possible. So when these opportunities come up, you can apply for really anything that's out there. But as we've seen, the industry has really exploded. There's so many jobs, uh, podcasts now. I mean, you can be a high school student and have your own podcast. All you need is a Twitter account. You can get it out there and, you know, you have a couple of big name guests and suddenly, you know, you've got a couple of followers. So I think the landscape of the industry has changed so dramatically in the last 20 years and, and it's changing uh, day to day and week to week. You're talking about the changing landscape. Has your advice changed over time? Like, let's say I was talking to you five years ago and compared to now, like, would you give me different advice or would it be the same? I think overall it's the same. What I try to do and what I try to do specifically first more than anything is what, what do I want to do specifically? Um, figure out what my strength was. For me, there was no doubt. It was play by play. That's what I wanted to do. When I first caught the bug early in my teenage years, that was the obsession that I had. And I don't know how it happened or why it happened, but listening to Marv Albert and Mike Breen and Al Michaels, And so many of my broadcast heroes, there was something about the play-by-play announcer, the person who was the conductor, the big voice, the presence, the resonance, the intimacy between the play-by-play man, especially on radio, and the viewer or listener. That was something that hooked me, and, and I knew that that's what I wanted to do. So for me, and again, everyone has their own path. Everyone has their own blueprint. For me, I wanted to hone that skill and put all of my focus and energy into that. So when I wasn't at FUV, the uh, student-run sports station at, at Fordham University, I was in my room with my tape recorder, watching a Knicks game with the sound down and, and calling a mock game into my recorder. Then listening to it back, getting a piece of a, a paper and a pencil out or a pen and, and making down my checklist. Hey, you know, I need to improve here, here, and here. Uh, this is okay. We need to do a little bit better here. Just constantly reevaluating and, and building my style and building kind of my, my comfort level with how I wanted to sound as an announcer. And I was very lucky in that I was able to get some opportunities and, um, and, and, you know, I just hope, and I, and I tell a lot of the kids at FUV and broadcast students around the country, if you can really focus and, and realize a, what is it I want to do and B kind of devote your focus and energy into that. Uh, I think you're, you, you're off to a good start. Now, was there ever was there ever a moment where you said, "Oh, I can't do this," or w- were you always confident in yourself and was like, "Yeah, I can definitely do play by play. This is what I was meant to do." I think you know there there is initial confidence, but until you have that moment where you feel like maybe you can get a job and, and do this for a living. For me, it was Marty Glickman, who uh, you know one of the titans of the industry. We were fortunate to have him do workshops with us for the last couple of years of his life. Uh, Marty pulled me aside one day, gave me a call and, and told me that he thought that I had a, a future in this business. That was really the first shot of confidence for me and, um, and really gave me kind of that sense that maybe there is a chance that I can do this for a living. And I wouldn't have to go back to the family business and run my father's diner in New Jersey. Um, you know, it, it's just, it, it's, a, it's a lonely path. I mean, I can remember graduating from Fordham I was a very impatient kid. I I wanted to have that job opportunity or that job offer the day after graduation. Uh, But it took months, you know, two, three months, four months going to the the FedEx station or the post office and mailing out my tapes and my reels, not hearing anything. Um, There were moments where I questioned kind of, you know, do I have to give this up? You know, do I have to go find a job and start making some money? Um, I think all of those doubts is is something that we all have to deal with as, as young kind of post-graduate broadcast hopefuls, and especially in this business. This is a very cutthroat, competitive business, but I think the earlier you can start and get a jump on things, get a jump on your development and your evolution, I think the better chance you have to succeed. Thanks to Spiro Ditas for joining me on this week's edition of Jack in the Booth. You can hear Spiro call NFL and NBA games on CBS and TNT, and can follow him on Twitter at Spiro Ditas. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Jack McShane.